A deduction based on my observations. Right, okay. Are we ready for this? And we'll be the judge <laughs> if this makes any sense. Hello and welcome to the channel. My name is Ed Hope, your friendly neighborhood doctor. And today we're gonna be reacting to and breaking down a Meku MD doctor detective. Thanks to everyone that recommended I check this one out. I'm guessing with the detective aspect and the fact the first episode is called Dr. Sherlock, it's gonna be a little bit like House, but with an anime. So if that's correct, we're in for a real treat. Tell me what's wrong with my baby. That's severe vertigo, extremity pain, Nausea, headache, and fatigue. That's a pretty broad range of symptoms. Could it be autoimmune? Lupus, maybe? Ah, oh, lupus, maybe. Well, I've seen what they've done there. Sick kid with fever, vomiting, vertigo, myalgia. Autoimmune's a good shout. What really should be top of your list is stuff you don't want to miss in this scenario. So something like sepsis. Could it be meningitis or a pneumonia? But something like that would have been found by the other doctors already. Based on the symptoms that he's presenting, it could be the result of a congenital gene abnormality. Cool, so we've got a little bit more context here and it is a bit like how, so other doctors have seen him before. However, what I would say, he's still come into the emergency department, so something has clearly changed and got worse. So my point before about sepsis, still totally valid, regardless of what has happened before, you still need to treat the patient that's in front of you. They are also considering a congenital gene abnormality, definitely something to consider in young children. And yet these diagnoses are very rarely gonna get diagnosed at first presentation. There are so many rare genetic disorders that they usually require specialist input. Mm. No elevation in his creatine kinase and no evidence of rhabdomyolysis either. And they also mention creatine kinase and rhabdomyolysis. So rhabdomyolysis is the pathological breakdown of your muscles. It can be caused by extreme overwork or crushing of the muscles, certain medications and toxins, viral infections, and rare genetic disorders as well. As the muscles break down, they release their contents into the bloodstream. Creatine kinase is one of those products. That's why we measure it in the blood to diagnose it. And these breakdown products of the muscles clog up the filters in your kidneys and lead to kidney failure. And that's the main danger of rhabdomyolysis. Treatment usually involves fluids to help the kidneys and then treat the underlying cause of the muscle breakdown. But actually in this patient, they say the creatine kinase is normal normal, so that's one thing easily checked off. It is a bit weird that they mention this test specifically being normal. There are much more important ones like the full blood count and renal function that I'd be much more interested in at this stage. So his labs look totally normal, but he's complaining of pain all over. It's just strange. So we have a kid with pain all over, but his blood tests are completely normal. Firstly, from an emergency point of view, this is reassuring, but only to a point. It's good that there isn't something grossly abnormal, so a big infection or something random like a leukemia or a lymphoma. However, on the flip side, if we did find something, we could treat it. Regardless of the bloods, you have to treat the patient in front of you. And this child clearly looks sick, so shouldn't be going anywhere. So should be referred to the pediatric department for further assessment. Did you eat anything different than usual in the past couple days? Next up, we have a old gentleman with abdo pain inquiring about eating anything different. Don't mind that as part of the abdominal history. They're thinking of a gastroenteritis picture, so food poisoning, which as you probably know, it usually comes along with diarrhea and vomiting. A very key thing for me here is that the emergency doctor doesn't examine the patient's abdomen properly. You should have the patient flat on their back. Now I'm not saying this is bad by the doctor because it may actually be a sign of what's going on. If the patient is in so much pain that they can't move, i.e. they want to remain completely still, this is a massive red flag and indicates potential peritonitis. So an infection of the inside covering of the abdomen, usually from a leak, such as a perforation of the bowel, and this is a life-threatening surgical emergency. And once you see a patient in severe abdominal pain lying completely still like this, you just never forget it. Maybe appendicitis? 
It's possible, but it could also be the early stages of gastroenteritis. Yeah, okay, so appendicitis and gastroenteritis, both valid differentials. But actually, for me, given the pain, I would start with differentials you don't want to miss. Could it be a perforation or an ischemic bowel, so a blockage in blood flow to the bowel, or even a ruptured AAA, so damage to the big blood vessel in your abdomen? We're going to order a CAT scan to confirm it. Great, so they're sending him for a CT scan. Cue the memes of emergency departments just getting CTs for everyone. But clearly this guy does need a CT. And before that, you really should get an ultrasound at the bedside though, because CTs can take a few hours. And as I said before, there's really some things that you want to rule out immediately. Dr. Takao, why are you here? Your shift will be ending in exactly 19 minutes and 24 seconds. So I came <laughs> to collect you. So here we are. We meet the new Dr. House. And I, for one, already like her. He has hypervitaminosis A. Oh. Headache, nausea, vomiting, general fatigue, myalgia, chylitis, and desquamation. Hypervitaminosis A. I was never gonna get that. Vitamin A is one of your fat soluble vitamins, so it's difficult for your body to excrete it by passing it out of your kidneys. So it makes it more possible for you to overdose on it if you're taking in more than your body can use it or pee it out. Due to elevated intracranial pressure. Vitamin A is fat soluble, which means it can just accumulate inside your body. There you go. Still got it. You've been making your sunny blueberry snacks and vitamin A supplements, correct? Y yes. But since his vision wasn't improving like you'd hoped, you started going over the recommended amount. So usually in TV shows, I mean, particularly House, the way the diagnosis gets sort of drawn out can be a little bit manufactured purely for drama. But actually here, I think it's pretty realistic how it plays out and it's also a really good learning point for anyone studying medicine. That is, you will always miss the diagnosis you don't consider. In this case, Dr. Emeku considered vitamin A overdose. She knew what to look out for and what questions to ask, all of which helped to reinforce the diagnosis. And as I've said many times on the channel, you don't often need all these fancy tests. Sometimes it's all there for you in the history. So top marks for that scene. Good grief. It's hard to believe a parent could even make their kid that sick. Mm. <laughs> wow, okay. Certainly a little bit spicy there. She's got a little bit of House's uh, bedside manner as well. Earlier today, you caught a fish and ate it raw, right? It was probably one of these mackerel, sardine, Medina, sea bream. It was sardine. How? How did she get that one? I know she's good, but how did she know he ate raw fish from that? How do you know what it was? A deduction based on my observations. Right, okay. Are we ready for this? And... We'll be the judge if this makes any sense. And looking at the tan lines on his face, you can tell he spends a lot of the day outside with a hat on. He doesn't appear capable of any long-term outdoor labor. So I figured he probably has a hobby you can do sitting down. I hold my hands up. There's at least some logic there, but it's still a pretty big hunch. And before the gastro team has seen them, you wanna make sure you've considered a surgical problem as it's far safer to rule out serious causes of abdominal pain on first presentation. So I feel like my approach and Dr. Emeku's approach would work well together. We'd make a decent team or <laughs> maybe we'd just clash a lot. Male in his 20s, report his patient found collapse at a construction site near Kudume Lake Park. On arrival, patient found unresponsive with complete amputation to his left lower leg. This is excellent. I love how realistic this is. Whenever patients are critically ill, paramedic crews will pre-alert the hospital to let them know what they're about to receive. And here the crew have given a fairly good structured history of what's happened. There are various tools that different hospitals use to make sure you include all the vital information. So in this case, the cardiac arrest team and the trauma team can be activated and come together to assign roles to get into PPE and prepare the equipment. I say the handover here is fairly good because really they should mention first of all that he's in a cardiac arrest because that's the most important thing. For now, prepare some normal saline, blood transfusions and epinephrine too. We'll need a blood draw. 
I'll give more orders once the patient's here. Yeah, okay, nice. So we talked about them uh, assigning tasks and this is what's happening here. These are kind of basic things to point out but fair enough. Mentioning the blood transfusions though is very good because that probably takes the most amount of time to get ready and is likely the cause of the patient's cardiac arrest. So they've had a traumatic amputation and the loss of blood has caused hypovolemic shock which has caused the cardiac arrest. So really you want to stop the bleeding and replace the blood to save their life. So you're just ditching our study session? Sorry, but I'm still on the clock right now. We'll just have to study later. Hey! Yeah, this is very realistic. When in training, you usually have teaching once a week and it's registered with a mandatory number of sessions you have to make, otherwise you get into a bit of trouble. But yeah, sometimes things happen like this and you know, you kind of have to prioritize saving someone's life. Is that paint? Okay, this is not a lot of blood for someone that's had a traumatic amputation. Also, the blood being black, very random. I've only ever seen the usual blood, you know, the red stuff. Monitor on. I need one amp of epinephrine stack. I have the stretcher. IV line attached, cutting sheet now. Yeah, I like this. We see a nicely organized resuscitation. They don't always go as smoothly in real life, but the best ones are a lot calmer and methodical than TV shows would have you believe. And realistically here, you'd have more hands on deck with the person leading the cardiac arrest stood at the end of the bed, maintaining oversight and control. And yet, as I said, there'd be a full trauma team in the hospital. So that would include an anesthetist to manage the airway, a general surgeon and an orthopedic surgeon in this case to look at the amputation. But clearly in this story, they want the main characters at the center of it and they're playing these roles. Also, you can see here, no tourniquet on the leg amputation. <clears throat> yeah, so the pupils aren't reacting to light. So this is a very bad sign and indicates brain death. But even more indicative of death is the patient is in rigor mortis. So they've probably been dead for a while. Rigor mortis starts in the face usually after a couple of hours. This stiffness occurs after death because it actually takes energy for your muscles to release. They actually work very similar to a ratchet system. And when they've used up all their energy stores after death, they get locked into a position. Uh, yeah, I tried to tell you over the phone, but this patient's blood, it's blue. So we are actually dealing with funny colored blood. So it's not black, it's blue blood. The fact the patient is dead makes this something that maybe could be possible as I don't know if there's anything in reality that would give you blue blood that would mean you'd be alive. You need your blood to have red blood cells and their red hemoglobin in order to carry oxygen. Although I have heard of this myth before that blood in your veins is blue, probably because textbooks always show veins as blue. And the fact that if you look at the veins on your body, they look blue to you. But this is just because your skin acts as a kind of Instagram filter on your blood vessels. Although when you take blood from a patient, you can very often tell if it's come from an artery or a vein because oxygenated blood that's in the artery is often a brighter red than the kind of darker red of the deoxygenated blood from the veins. A bite from a stupidly large set of jaws. A bite wound from a stupidly large jaw. Okay, so this is what I'm thinking. There's a traumatic amputation from the animal bite and the blue blood is because something has spread in the blood after the bite. So the animal is either venomous or there's been some nasty bacteria in its mouth. But as to what kind of venom or bacterial infection that would cause your blood to turn blue, well, I have no freaking idea. A colossal monster severing people's legs and a man with blue blood. That's what I call interesting. <laughs> now that's what I call interesting. RIP the patient. Clearly this is not appropriate, but medicine is inherently interesting. So away from patient areas, it's okay to be excited about the things you see and do. I mean, that's good for the profession. But yeah, with this level of enthusiasm at the end of the bed, immediately after your cardiac arrest, uh, that just makes you a psychopath. Wait a minute. Are you trying to find out what happened to that patient? Obviously. But why? Let's just let the cops handle it. 
Okay, so in actual fact, we are encouraged to write up interesting cases. Often there is a slot within our weekly teaching for colleagues to present something that's interesting for everyone's learning. And something as bizarre as blue blood may also have interest further afield. Your department's function is to examine patients for diagnosis. That is, assisting living patients. A deceased patient does not need a diagnosis. I disagree on two counts. I'm with Dr. Ameku on this one. A dead patient needs a diagnosis both for the death certificate and for respect for them and their family to figure out what happened. But also, we should figure out what caused someone to die because, you know, it might help someone else from dying of the same thing. I mean, it does sound like she just wants to investigate for her own interest, but still, those points are valid. So the resistance here to her not investigating it is a little suspicious. Huh? That's right. This here is the animal that bit off our victim's leg. The Tyrannosaurus Rex! <laughs> well, I... I didn't see that coming. T-Rex was not in my differentials. I'm guessing she isn't talking about an actual T-Rex. That would be insane. Ah, but we're not gonna find out anymore. What a cliffhanger. And I guess if you want me to check out the next one, then you're gonna have to like the video and comment down below. So there you have it. I hope you enjoyed my thoughts on episode one. Thank you to everyone that recommended I check this one out. I really enjoyed it. There are obvious references to House, but you know, that just makes it better for me. And as I said, leave me a comment if you want me to check out any more episodes of this show or any other TV show or movies you think might be worth my watch. I hope you're all well. Thank you so much for all your support on the channel and I'll be back soon.